As we prepare to look in the Word, I remind your heart and mine as well about that indispensable principle, total reliance on the Holy Spirit. I want to give that verse again that we'll be using as we go through Exodus and then we'll go to prayer. It's Psalm 35 and verse 3. Say, just the last part of verse 3 actually. It says, Say to my soul, I am your salvation. We know that. We know it from the Bible. We know it from human messengers. But we need to hear the Lord say to us personally, I am thy salvation. So with that in mind, let's commit our time to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come to you. And we thank you for the indwelling Holy Spirit, whoever turns our eyes to Christ. And we just pray this morning in a fresh way, we would behold the Lord. We know when we see him, we're changed. We're not like we were. And so show us Christ today and enable us to be completely detached from everything that would distract us, especially in these busy political days. Clear our minds, we pray, and help us to focus on you. Thank you, Lord, that we can trust you for that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> All right. <coughs> Welcome to our... Psalm 35, verse 3. 3. Thank you. 3B. Got it. All right. <coughs> Uh, welcome to our uh, little look at the Lord Jesus as he's revealed to us in the book of Exodus. Last week we tried to introduce the book and uh, I told you that Lillian is on me pretty heavy to have only a few introduction lessons. Uh, so this will also be sort of an introduction lesson, a little bit in the book. But the second introduction and the final introduction to her joy. Okay. <laughs> In our last session, I attempted to give an overview of the message of Exodus. And in a single word, the message of Exodus is redemption. It's salvation. And not only salvation, but if you're going to understand the whole book of Exodus, full salvation full salvation through a complete Savior. The book of Exodus continues the story that began in Genesis. And uh, it, we went back all the way to Abraham and the covenant. But in fact, you could go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And in fact, you could go back further than that into eternity past, into the heart, the mind, the purposes of the Lord. But for our purposes in Exodus, we went back to Abraham where God first gave his wonderful covenant, his unconditional covenant of grace, that he would build a nation. Uh, listen again, please, Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country, from your relatives, from your father's house, to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, make your name great, so shall you be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now as I tried to show last week, just the uh, bare definition of a nation, in order to be a nation, you must have three things. You must have people. You must have some kind of a government. And you must have land. Now I say, you can't be a nation without those three things. There's one exception. And that is God's people Israel. God's people Israel. There are people. And there's a government. But God has preserved them many, many years without a land. And so they become the one exception. But you need people, you need government, and you need land. 
Uh, much attention is called in Exodus chapter 1 about God moving toward his promise to Abraham to build a nation. And it starts with that population explosion. We need people. Exodus 1.7, the sons of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly and multiplied and became exceedingly mighty. So the land was filled with them. And then verse 10, Come, let us deal wisely with them, said the Egyptians, or else they'll multiply. And in the event of war, they'll join themselves to those who hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. Chapter 1, verse 12, The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied, the more they spread out, so that they were in dread of the sons of Israel. As we move through the Bible story, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and so on through the Bible, we'll see God building his nation. He's going to provide people. And in this book, he'll lay the foundation of a government in the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. Not only the foundation for their government, but all governments uh, go back to Mount Sinai. And then finally, as we saw in Joshua, in picture form, he takes them into the land. People, government, land. Now all of that is literal. In other words, it actually happened. It's history. As we read the Bible, this is not made up stories. This is actual history. And because it's history, we call it history, but because it's a historical parable. In other words, behind the history, there is a spiritual reality. That's why you've heard me often use the expression redemptive history, because it tells the story of redemption. It's real history, but it's also the story of salvation. Uh, John 18, verse 33, our Lord Jesus was standing before Pilate, and uh, Pilate asked him, verse 33, Therefore Pilate entered again into the praetorium, summoned Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Here was his answer, John 18, 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting, so I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. And so, in the Old Testament, God is building a kingdom, people, government, land, in order to picture a kingdom that's not of this world. In other words, that kingdom that's real is a parable of the kingdom, we call it the kingdom of God. There are kingdom of God parables. There are kingdom of heaven parables. It's a picture of us. It's a picture of the church, the spiritual kingdom. And so the kingdom that we are talking about, Israel, pictures a spiritual kingdom. It's summarized wonderfully in Colossians 1, 13 and 14. He rescued us for the, from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Some people make a mistake when they study Exodus and they only say Exodus teaches us that God delivers us out of Egypt. That's part of it. But you notice Colossians. He's delivered us out of one kingdom into another kingdom. And that's very important. Salvation in Christ does not leave us kingless. It takes us from one slavery to another slavery. It takes us out of the bondage of Satan and puts us under the lordship in the domain of Christ. 
When he sets us free, he doesn't mean you're now free to do your own thing. That's not freedom. We were made to be dependent. And so when we're set free, we are not set free to do our own thing. We're set free to do his thing. We are set free now to do the will of God. And that's the message of Exodus. Out of Egypt unto the new kingdom, into a union with Christ, under the law. Uh, It's a new covenant law, but it's under the law. So I'm delivered from one kingdom into another. We need a master. Uh, Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters. He'll either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't do both, but you have to do one. And so we're taught and we believe and our prayer is ever. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's a heavenly kingdom. It's not of this world. It's spiritual, but it is mirrored in the history of Israel. God has taken the great principles of spiritual life and fossilized them in the redemptive history of his ancient people, Israel. So, we're talking about the message of Exodus. It's salvation, but it's full salvation. It takes us into the Lordship of Christ. Uh, So the kingdom we'll be looking at, uh, if we got all the way to Samuel, I would give you the full statement of the government. Uh, We're going to be looking at the picture the theocratic constitutional monarchy that God's going to raise up in the history, but it's all a picture of the kingdom. The kingdom which no one enters except from what John chapter 3, 3 records what Jesus told the Nicodemus. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, He cannot see the kingdom of God. We can study the history, but to enter into the spiritual side, we need to be born from above. So in Exodus, we're studying the full picture of salvation, but I'm going to constantly be coming back to the reality. Uh, Not only deliverance from Egypt, but unto King Jesus. Uh, That's what I mean by full salvation. And so the message, the theme of Exodus is a a complete, a full salvation provided by a complete Savior. Uh, Exodus begins in gloom. You read chapter 1. It ends in glory. Read chapter 40. With the glory of God filling the tabernacle. Uh, That's It starts in gloom, but it ends in glory. And to have a complete salvation, uh, we've got to have a complete Savior. One who's qualified not only to take us out of Egypt, but then to fill his house of skin with his glory. So that's really the message of, of Exodus. The key verse that we're using is Exodus chapter 3, verse 8. I've chosen that verse because it includes both sides. Exodus 3.8 says, I've come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. And there you have it in picture form. Out of Egypt into a land flowing with milk and honey. I want you to glance once more, please, at the handout sheet I gave. We're going to be following that pretty close, but as we go on, we'll keep filling it in. Uh, This is just the skeleton. This is just the the bone. Does everyone have one of those sheets? You don't have one. Okay. Uh, Thank you. And anybody else need one?
Yeah, we're going to be sticking pretty close to this as an outline. Now, if you glance at the sheet, you'll notice that the first part is the out of Egypt part, from Egypt, by power and by blood. And then the second part gives us six pictures. Uh, we're looking at that the same way we looked at the end of the book of Joshua. It's the story of the Shekinah glory cloud. It's the story of the song of, of Moses and Miriam. It's the story of supernatural provision of manna and water out of the rock and quail. It's a story of victory over uh, at Rephidim, over Amalek. It's the story of the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. It's the story of the building of the tabernacle. If I'm really saved by power and blood, all of those things will be true in my life. If you're saved by power and blood, all those things will be true in your life. Now I'll tell you where we are this morning. Uh, again, keep that before you, that little paper. And uh, where, Lord willing, we'll start to develop in detail in subsequent studies. If you glance at the handout sheet, number one, you see God's supernatural redemption by power and by blood. And that covers 12 chapters. I want to fill in a little more about those 12 chapters. You notice the outline there really focuses on chapters 7 to 11. You see that? And so my question is, what about the first six chapters? What's that about? And that's what I want to begin to give you this morning. Uh, so let me fill in the outline. Uh, the first six chapters answer the question, how God prepares us so that we can be delivered by power and by blood. Now, chapter 1, just at a glance, is all about slavery. It's all about captivity. It's all about bondage in Egypt. They've been there for hundreds of years. I cannot be redeemed out of Egypt until I see my need to be delivered out of Egypt. In other words, uh, <laughs> I have a terrible time, everyone knows, finding my way. Uh, sometime I'm lost and don't know it. And I keep going. I went to visit my son in the hospital recently. And uh, the hospital wasn't far away. Uh, but after two hours, I figured I probably missed something. <laughs> And I was, I kept going and going. I never got to see him in the hospital because I don't. I think they moved the hospital, something like that. But you cannot be found unless you know you're lost, and you can't be healed unless you know you're sick, and you can't be saved unless you know that you need to be saved. That's just how chapter 1 is. So chapter 1 gives us the need for salvation. I'm going to be saved by power and blood, but I've got to be brought to the place where I know I need it. There's no other way. There's no other help. There's no other remedy. I need to be saved. Egyptian slavery, Egyptian bondage made them cry out for deliverance. That was God's preparation on their salvation. Exodus 2, 23. It came about in the course of many days that the king of Egypt died, and the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage. And they cried out, and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. But it started with their cry. Egypt made them cry. We saw that many times in the book of Judges, and now we see it here. So chapter 1 is the need to be redeemed. All right, that's followed then by chapters 2 to 6. What's that about? And the answer is, God provides a human redeemer. 
You need to be saved, but then you need a human redeemer in order to save you. Uh, in this case, it's going to be Moses. And we'll spend quite a bit of time just looking at the man. So chapter 1 is the need for salvation. And chapter 2 to 6 shows us how God prepares and provides a human redeemer. And after we look at that in detail, then we'll go back to the outline and see how he saves by power and by blood. Power illustrated by the plagues, and power illustrated by crossing of the Red Sea, and blood illustrated by the innocent blood of that victim lamb, the Passover lamb. And so we'll get to that. But we'll focus this morning in a broad overview, and then starting next week, more detail on those first six chapters. Let me begin by giving you an early picture of the picture and then the reality. I want to keep going to the reality so that we don't just get lost in the history. It's easy studying the Old Testament just to get lost in the history. All right, Exodus 1.8. Now a king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Well, all we know so far is it's a king. Exodus 1, 15. Then the king of Egypt, we know he's a king, spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Sifra, the other was named Pua. And he said, when you're helping the Hebrew women to give birth and see them upon the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall put him to death. If it's a daughter, then she shall live. Now we look at verse 19. The midwives said to Pharaoh. See, up till this time, all we know is it's the king. It's the king. But now we learn, she said, they said to Pharaoh. Now Pharaoh is a title. It's not a first name like Ed or Joe or Bill or Sam, something like that. Uh, it actually means, the word Pharaoh means Son, S-U-N, because Pharaoh was called the S-O-N of the S-U-N, because they worshiped the son. So he's the son of the son. He's the Pharaoh. But that's just a title, like president, or like Ayatollah, or like uh, a czar. In the New Testament, you had like the Caesars, and uh, the Herods, and so on. There were many Pharaohs. Now, I'm not going to do what my commentators do and uh, drag you through the study to prove that the Pharaoh of Moses' day was Ramses II of the 19th dynasty. Do you care? No. Either do I. So we're all delivered from that. Uh, I'm going to refer to Pharaoh as if it was a, a man's name, just so that we can go through the story. And Pharaoh made an edict. Verse 15, we'll read it again. I'll just read the last part. Uh, when you are helping the Hebrew women to give birth and see them upon the birth stool, if it's a son, you shall put him to death. If it's a daughter, then she shall live. Uh, kill all the baby boys. Now his reason was to stop the population explosion because especially the boys they'll grow up to be military men and uh, they might cause an insurrection and, and join enemies and so on we see that chapter 1 9 and 10 which I'll not read again but behind the scenes it's bigger than Pharaoh saying kill the baby boys because Satan is out to destroy the messianic seed. All through the Bible, from Genesis chapter 315 all the way through, you have the war. The seed of the serpent against the seed of the woman. The seed of the serpent is trying to kill and to corrupt. The seed of the woman counteracts and the seed of the woman then preserves or purifies. 
And so you have this trying to kill, trying to corrupt, God preserving, God purifying. And that war you can trace all the way through the Bible. Now the third fact is uh, actually the message of Exodus chapter 3.8. I've come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians. So those, that's the picture. Pharaoh, kill the babies out of Egypt. Now let's go to the reality. In the Old Testament, it was Pharaoh. New Testament, Matthew 2, verse 2, there's a different king. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where's he who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests, the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where Messiah was to be born. He was threatened. He was threatened by this baby. And so, Matthew 2.16 when Herod saw he'd been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he determined from the Magi. You see, it's the same thing. And how did God deliver? Matthew 2, 13. Now when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, said, Get up, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt, remain there till I tell you. Herod's going to search for the child to destroy him. And so Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night, left for Egypt. And he remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt have I called my son. Now, I hope you can see the picture and the reality uh, as it's applied to Christ. Why is that prophecy, out of Egypt have I called my son? Why does that apply to Jesus when clearly it's quoted from Hosea 11, 1, 1 and 2, and it's not Jesus. It's not Messiah. It's the nation. Listen to Hosea 1, ver, uh, chapter 11, verse 1. When Israel was a youth, I loved him. And out of Egypt have I called my son. The more they called, the more they went from them. They kept sacrificing to Baals and burning incense to idols. That's Israel. That's the nation. That's not Jesus. Now we read, they called Jesus out of Egypt to fulfill the prophecy. Out of Egypt have I called my son. It's because Jesus is identifying with his people. He's doing the same thing he did when he stepped in the Jordan in the waters of baptism. He didn't need to be baptized. He didn't have sins to confess. But he wanted to stand with sinners. He wanted to identify with sinners. And so now here we have the same thing. Behind the scenes, a king wanting to stop Jesus, kill Messiah. But he identifies with his people, and out of Egypt have I called my son. That's Exodus. A, a king, Pharaoh, wanting to kill babies to stop redemption. And out of Egypt, he's going to call his son. And so I just wanted you to see the picture, and then come to the reality, because only Jesus can take us out of Egypt. And so... That's why it's there. Deuteronomy 6.21. Egypt is such a picture. It says, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. And the Lord brought us up from Egypt with a mighty hand. Egypt pictures slavery. 
Deuteronomy 15, 15. Remember, you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. By the way, every time you see redeemed, you got to remember there's a price. There's no redemption without a payment. And, of course, the payment is the precious blood of our Lord Jesus. It's also called the iron furnace, Deuteronomy 4.20. The Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace from Egypt to be a people for his own possession as today. Only Christ can take us out of the iron furnace. Uh, in the Old Testament, Egypt is continually referred to as having confidence in the flesh, trusting yourself. Isaiah 30, verse 1. Woe to the rebellious children, declares the Lord, who executes a plan, but not mine, makes an alliance, but not of my spirit, in order to add sin to sin, who proceed down to Egypt without consulting me, to take refuge in the safety of Pharaoh, to seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore, the safety of Pharaoh will be your shame, the shelter, shelter in the shadow of Egypt, your humiliation. Isaiah 31, verse 1. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, rely on horses, trust in chariots, because they're many, in horsemen, because they're very strong. They do not look to the Holy One of Israel, nor seek the Lord. Isaiah 36, 6. Behold, you rely on the staff of this crushed reed, even on Egypt, on which if a man leans, it will go into his hands and pierce it. So Pharaoh, king of Egypt, is to all who rely upon him. It's so important to believe that deliverance out of Egypt in chapter 1 is a picture of bondage. It's a picture of being in the iron furnace. It's a picture of depending on the flesh, depending on self. We read in the New Testament in John 6, 44, no one can come unless he draws him, unless the Father draws him. Well, that's what this bondage was all about. God was drawing them. He allowed that. That was preparation. Because nobody comes to the Lord unless they feel the weight of their sin. Especially if you don't know the Lord at all. It's also true of hard-hearted Christians. But even if, if you don't know the Lord, you will never, never, never cry out to be delivered unless the Lord shows you how much you need him. Our will, since man fell into sin, is against God. It's accustomed to sin. We don't want to hear about holiness. That's the natural heart. The heart of a sinner is, is blind, and the person is ignorant, and he lives unto himself. And it's all, everything is selfish. And man is full of pride. To recognize the need, I need to be saved. I need Jesus. I need salvation. I need to be saved from sinful self. Actually, more than that, I need to be saved from righteous self. I need to be delivered from self. That's a mighty miracle of God. Naturally, nobody sees themselves as poor, miserable, wretched, empty creatures, uh, insect of the dust. Nobody sees themselves that way. It takes a miracle to show us that we need Christ. Not one single tear of repentance has ever fallen from the eye of someone who was not convinced that they needed to repent. And that's where the miracle comes in. So until God prepares, until God draws, uh, nobody will turn to him. That's how the story began. Out of Egypt have I called my son to lead God's people out of the iron furnace. To lead God's people out of slavery. To lead God's people out of self-confidence. Jesus leads the way. Now hold that please 
from chapter 1, and I want to introduce verse, chapters 2 to 6. And once again, I'm going to do it in an overview, and then we'll home in on it in more detail. Uh, we want to look at the human deliverer, who in this case is Moses, and how the Lord worked in his life to prepare him to be his instrument of redemption. Now, Moses is clearly a picture of Christ. An imperfect picture. There's no doubt about that. But he's a picture of Christ. We see that in several places. Deuteronomy 18, 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen, and you shall listen to him. Acts chapter 3, verses 22 and 23. Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed in everything he says to you. And it will be that every soul that does not give heed to the, that prophet shall be utterly destroyed. And also Hebrews chapter 3, uh, we're not going to look at those verses, but there's that relationship between Christ and Moses. But Moses, though he pictures Christ, in this context is more a picture of the instrument God uses to deliver people out of captivity. In other words, ultimately it's Christ. He's God's appointed qualified redeemer to lead God's people out of Egypt. But God is going to use Moses. And so Moses now becomes the human instrument through which God will bring redemption. And just to jump quickly to the reality, uh, it's a picture of you. God wants to use you to help others be set free from their slavery and bring them into the kingdom of Christ. God wants to use me. God wants to use us. And his instrument of redemption is the church, is the people of God. Many of God's people, spiritually speaking, are still in Egypt. They're still in Egypt. Even after God's people were delivered from Egypt, they had to be delivered from the reproach of Egypt. The smell of Egypt was still on them, and so on. Uh, so God's going to use a human deliverer. Now, as we read the story of Moses, we're going to see how God prepares Moses, because that's how he'll prepare you. How God prepares Moses, that's how he'll prepare me. How God prepares Moses... That's how he'll prepare us. God wants to use Moses to deliver others. But Moses needed his own exodus first. Moses needed to be delivered from Moses. And before I can be one to deliver anybody out of captivity, I've got to be delivered from Ed Miller. I've got to be delivered from myself. And so we're going to look at God's working in Moses' life. He's going to bring the exodus, but he needs one himself. And so uh, we're going to see how God prepared him and how many long years it took. Now I'm going to give an overview this morning and then press in on the details in subsequent study. Let me just turn this tape over. <clears throat> All right, out of Egypt have I called my son. Uh, I'm going to show you now uh, the bones, the skeleton, just the outline of how God's going to do this. Because I'm convinced the way he does it for Moses He'll do it for Israel. And the way he does it for Israel, he'll do it for you. And he'll do it for me. So we're going to look at the picture 
and then the reality. Well, actually, I believe in this case, it will help us to look at the reality first. So I'm going to back into the picture because I think we're more aware, we're more clear about what we've experienced. And so we can, if we see the truth and then look back and say, wow, that's the same thing in Moses. Wow, that's the same thing in the nation. So let me do that. Uh, we'll start with the reality. This is the testimony of my own life and experience and probably of yours as well. I'm going to mention four, what do you call it, points. <laughs> That's horrible, four points. <laughs> Realities, four characteristics. When God prepares someone to be an instrument of deliverance for someone else, he always starts with number one, and from there goes to number two, from there to number three, from there to number four. You're not ready until you get the number four. All right? So that's what we're going to look at. So I'll mention the realities, and then you'll see it in your life. Uh, now, just, I can tell you that it's point number one, and I can say that in five seconds. Point number one. Uh, but sometimes point number one takes many years to get to point number one. Uh, in my own life, took 16 years uh -huh. to get to point number one. Point two came pretty rapidly after that. But then point three took me another seven years before I began to see it, and I'm still working or still seeing things from point three. And for the last 39 years, he's been working point four in me. So that just gives you an idea. Now for you, it might be shorter, it might be longer. And I'm just giving you this idea. We're just going to call them points. One, two, three, four, write it down in your book. But, but this is life and this is experience and the time will vary. But sooner or later, if you're going to be used by the Lord to help others, you're going to walk this path. And if your church or your group, the body is going to be used by the Lord, they got to follow this same path. Never changes. These are the ways of God. And may God help us as we look at it. All right. I've already hinted at the first, but now let me give a name to it. The name is, it begins with pure grace. That's the first thing. From the first 12 chapters can be summarized. From the heart of man, a cry. From the heart of God supply. That's what these 12 chapters are all about. That man cries and God supplies. God is always the first cause. God is always the initiator. You open your Bible and what are the first words you read? In the beginning, God. That's true of every step along the way. So the first step is God did something, and he did something when I knew nothing about it. It involved me, it happened to me, but it was a long time ago, and I was completely unaware of it. And for the reality, it's the truth of Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. How long? Did you live before you learned that you died 2,000 years ago on the cross? That happened in history. And that's pure grace. And it starts with something God does in Christ, and you're included. That's the first step. Step two. What shall we call step two? I'll just refer to it as salvation from Egypt. Uh, it answers to the experience. We've seen our need. God prepared us. We cried out to the Lord. That's why I said it took me 16 years. In fact, I just celebrated my spiritual birthday. January 29, 1958. God accepted me as his own personal son. Glorious day. 
when I invited the Lord to be my Savior. Step one, God did it long before I knew it. Step two, there had to come a time in my life when I heard it. Faith comes by hearing, and I accepted it, and I received the Lord. What is step three? Theologians have a word for this. They call it sanctification. It's the process by which God teaches me, Philippians 3.3. 3. We're the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God, glory in Christ Jesus. This last part. Put no confidence in the flesh. That's why I say sometime it takes years. It takes years to come to the place where you put no confidence in the flesh. Even though Proverbs 28, 26 says, He who trusts his own heart is a fool. How foolish have we been? You trust yourself, you're a fool. That's what God says. This tendency to be independent came when Adam sinned. We were created to be dependent. And this whole idea of being independent took place when Adam sinned. I can do it. I can handle it. Leave me alone. Don't try to help me. You're embarrassing me. I can handle it. I don't want to depend on the Lord. And I don't want to depend on the government. And I don't want to depend on my loving family to take care of me. I can do it. Leave me alone. That independent spirit. uh, Please, don't don't take my driver's license. I, I don't want to be dependent. Don't take my driver's license. Don't take my checkbook. Even though I get confused, I can still handle my own money. Don't take my checkbook away. Don't take my independence. That's built in. That's built into everybody. And... After some block of time, we come to see how stupid it's been to trust our own wisdom, to trust our own strength, to trust our own righteousness. That third step is God weaning us from confidence in the flesh. It starts with God's grace. Something happened in my history I knew nothing about, and it involved me. Step two, it finally was revealed to me, and my heart said yes, and I accepted it. Step three, I'm trusting myself, trusting myself. I came as a helpless sinner, but now I think I'm a a sufficient Christian, and I need to see I'm a helpless Christian. As helpless a Christian as ever, I was a helpless sinner without the Lord. Finally, Step four, this is full salvation. The realization that I can't live by my life, we call this the exchange life. (laughs) When I have to live by his life, there's no other life. He's redeemed me from, but now I see that it must be unto him, union with him. Those are the four steps. Grace, deliverance by a decision, when you choose deliverance from self-confidence and then finally the exchange life all right now let's go backwards do we see those four experiences in Moses life because he's going to be God's instrument of redemption and the answer is yes we do I'll give you the bones of it here but we see the same four step Exodus 2 23 or rather 2 2 and 3. The woman conceived, bore a son. When she saw he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got him a wicker basket, covered it over with tar and pitch. She put the child into it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. You remember the story. Now that command was to put babies to death, boy babies. But his parents said no. And according to Hebrews 11, they did that by faith. By faith, 
Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because she saw, they saw he was a beautiful child. They were not afraid of the king's edict. In Exodus, that word that the New American Standard translates wicker basket made out of reeds is exactly the same word that's used for Noah's ark. She put him in an ark. The ark was a picture of Christ, salvation. And long before Moses knew it, he was already placed in the ark of salvation. He was a baby. He did not know that. He had to come to learn about that. I'll develop it in more detail, but for now, that's step one. Something happened in Moses' life that he knew nothing about. It involved his salvation. It involved the ark. It involved being delivered. Step two, Hebrews 11, verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he'd grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. He was looking for the reward. When we get into that, I'll show you from Stephen's sermon how God came to Moses when he was in Egypt and gave a revelation and how he responded to that revelation. But that's step two. There came a time when Moses made a decision. I choose the reproach of Christ. I choose to be identified with the afflicted people of God rather than the treasures and the vain promises offered by Egypt. Step three. This is a crisis in Moses' life. Exodus 2 verse 11. Came about in those days when Moses had grown up, he went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that, and when he saw there was no one around, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And he went out the next day, and behold, two Hebrews were fighting with each other. And he said to the offender, Why are you striking your companion? But he said, Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Are you intending to kill me as you kill the Egyptian? And Moses was afraid and said, Surely the matters become known. When Pharaoh heard of the matter, he tried to kill Moses. Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled down in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. God told Moses, You will be the deliverer. Moses was happy. And he thought, God told me, he must have told everybody. Everybody knows, I'm going to be the deliverer. And then he tried to do it, one Egyptian at a time. He trusted the flesh. He went out and he killed the Egyptian. And what happened? For the next 40 years, he was abandoned to the wilderness of Midian. You say, what's the wilderness of Midian? It's the same wilderness that Israel will go around for 40 years. God's preparing Moses. God did something in his life he knew nothing about that involved him in salvation. Put him in an ark. There came a time in his life where he chose, I choose Christ, the reproach of Christ. And then he went out to do it in his own strength. And God had to send him out in the desert and out there he learned many, many things in the wilderness. Finally, Exodus 3, 1 to 6, step 4. Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. 
The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. And when the Lord saw that he turned to aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. And he also said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face. He was afraid to look at God. I'll show you when we get to it how this was the exchanged life for Moses. Here he saw the exchanged life. And so you see in the life of Moses, I'm crucified with Christ. Moses was in the ark. I accepted Christ as my Savior. He decided I'm not staying in Egypt any longer. I choose the reproach of Christ. I had to learn through bitter experience not to trust Ed Miller. Moses had to learn through bitter experience not to trust Moses. I finally, by God's grace, saw Christ as my life. At the burning bush, Moses saw Christ as his life. Let's go back one more time. <clears throat> what was true of me and what's true of you and what's true of Moses is also true of the group, true of Israel. You see, they had grace long before they knew it. Because the promise God gave to Abraham, they were included in that promise. That was many years before they knew it. They too were delivered by power and blood. We'll study that when they put the blood on the door and they accepted Christ into their life. They too trusted themselves and had to go out into the wilderness for 40 years. And in the book of Exodus, and later we'll see as they crossed the Jordan River, they had to have the exchange life. They saw it in the tabernacle, house made of skin filled with his glory. And when they crossed the Jordan, and when they went into the land, that pictures Christ. So let me just flip it over. Moses in the ark, Israel in captivity, and the promise God gave to Abraham and me, I'm crucified with Christ. Uh, Moses uh, at the revelation leaves Egypt and I at the revelation accepted Christ and Israel uh, they were saved by power and by blood. Moses tries to do it on his own and uh, he's in the wilderness I tried to do it on my own, and for seven years I was out in the wilderness, and Israel tried to do it, and they were out there. Do you see what I'm saying? And then uh, Moses had his burning bush, and Israel had their tabernacle, and I have discovered the exchange life. Well, let's close with this, Psalm 35 and verse 3. Say to my soul, I am thy salvation. All of this is about Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Exodus and how you put yourself in this marvelous book. Thank you, Lord, that you lead the way out of Egypt and we follow. And we pray that you would instruct our hearts as we go through these pictures and take us quickly and really to all that these pictures intend. Work these things in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.